you for your opportunity to come here. We thought with all of the change going on that it would make sense to bring our groups in and kind of cover a lot of information at one time because um, this could be an individual conversation with each of our organizations. We're happy to do that, but we thought if we kind of bring you in and say, here's what to expect, you can have an idea and already be brainstorming. And there's some basic ideas that you say, no, we're definitely not interested in that, or yes, we want to learn more about this option. Um, because once we get up to your renewal, it goes fast. You all know that, is that um, you know, the carriers give us like a 60 day window once we have your new rates of what to expect. And that window goes really quick when we, especially if you make some changes, you want to get ID cards in hand on time. So we want you to kind of come away with this and say, okay, this is what I want to do. And we also want you to know that you're not limited to just your time frame. And I'm going to talk about in a second here just some um, different changes that are going on. Let me switch this to the main screen. But we are going to uh, talk about as well of um, just the timing of things. So if you say, this looks great, let's go ahead and take a look at this outside of our renewal time, like by all means, I think that, especially when you'll hear some of the um, stats that are going to be coming up and how many groups are renewing at one time, you may want to consider that as well. So we want you to have some flexibility with it, but at least walk away knowing um, what to do. So you may be thinking, why now? We either just did a renewal, or maybe you took the early renewal back in December, and you're thinking, okay, well, we're locked in until December of 2014. Why do I even need to consider anything now? I will tell you because of the fact that there's so much more to even think about. Um, the medical options to consider, if you remember over the last few years, those of you who have been handling or just been with insurance for so long know that for a long time, especially in the 80s, HMOs were really big. And then HMOs kind of slid out, and over the last few years, there haven't been too many of those. Well, they popped back up because now they're trying to find more affordable health options for groups. So you're going to see more plan design options. So not only are you going to see those um, POS plans and those PPO plans, you're going to see a lot more HMO plans. Um, a lot of the carriers came out with copay only plans. They got rid of the deductibles and went back to the old copay only plans, similar to the old school HMO plans. Um, so you're going to see that plan designs are just all over the place where for the last few years they really narrowed that market and we can say, okay, here's kind of where everything's leaning. Well, now they've kind of opened up and broadened that. And then we have the concept that Monty's going to be covering here later is you have, should we go individual plans or should we stay with the group coverage? Because that whole market has really changed things a lot. And in the past where you may have said, we can't even consider individual plans, now you might be able to. And then for groups your size, you're thinking, we've never been able to um, consider self-insured options. And the carriers have gotten really creative, and don't be scared when you hear that term self-insured, especially for groups your size. Um, but the carriers have gotten very creative and have, want you to look at what's fully insured, like most of you are now, where we're working directly with a carrier, versus trying to look at some plans that um, have some self-insured option within it. So a lot to really think about, a lot more than we ever had in the past. Um, so you have more options. Another thing to consider is those of you who went through the early renewal where we changed your renewal to December of last year, a lot of the carriers we were providing you with data and we were saying this is where the carrier expects your rates to be once you go to the new health care reform plans because it's all how the rating system is changing. And we were to say, okay, they're saying this is a good option for you to renew early and they're saying no, you should um, you know, say where you're at or it's not a good option. And we had shared with you some data that we had gotten from the carriers kind of with it. Well, what we found is that that data wasn't always accurate once the rates actually came out. So we're finding that what may have been a really good fit for you then, we may find that, or just demographics or your group has changed, that it may not always be the best benefit for you to stick with 2013 rates and not move, you know, and then rather just to move to the new 2014. And I'll talk to you about how those rates work because you may be wondering what's the difference. We'll talk about that because there were some specific information. And remember when we were covering this all last year, we didn't have true rates. We had no idea what the rates were even going to look like. They hadn't been released by the carriers. They kept saying, we're going to get you the rates, we're going to get you the rates. And they, they were getting delayed by just getting everything approved. So we were going over with the groups and saying, this looks like it's going to be a good option. And we had to give that caveat. We, we're not 100% accurate. You know, we, we're going by what the carrier is telling us. We're going by what we anticipate. And so what we're finding is that 
things have definitely changed a little bit there. And what we're finding the biggest factor is a group can look identical. We can have two groups that could be the same size and even similar in demographics, but where that mid that factor is, is that your, remember grade score had your health history included in them, so you got rated up based on the health of your group. Well, that health history plays a really big factor in determining whether 2014 is good or bad because 2014 rates don't factor that in. So again, we'll talk about a little bit more about that. Um, key packet, that's the name of the law. So health care reform, um, the Affordable Care Act, key packet, those are all the exact same thing. Don't get confused when you hear Obamacare, you hear all these different terms for it, they all refer to the same thing. This law that has impacted health insurance. But as I'm sure you've seen with the news, it changes a lot, almost daily at times. We're constantly having to readjust our sales to make sure that we lead you in the right direction. So we're going to go through some of the delays and changes. The fourth quarter chaos. This is what I was referring to before. We had so many groups, and it's not just us. This is across the board. The busiest renewal time of the year are January 1st renewals. Makes sense. A lot of people want to be calendar year renewal with their calendar year deductible because all medical plans, with the exception of just a few out there, renew. They all have your deductible start over again January 1st. Well, then carriers came out last year based on the law and trying to anticipate not having to make any changes going into 2014, and they came out and said, you can renew early, and you can renew December 1st. Well, now think about how many companies are now renewing December and January. So that during that fourth quarter where everything's going to be on, going on, where we're shopping in the market, we're looking at the options, we're trying to get information from the carriers, think about how many other groups are also going to be doing that exact same thing. We anticipate things could really slow down and take a lot longer than we have done in the past because um, just even for our instance alone, <coughs> half of our business now is in that time frame. That is a lot. That is a lot. But that's not just us. We're finding the carriers are saying the same thing. Half of their business is falling in this December or January time frame. So the reason we kind of point that out is note that if we stick with where you're at and you are in that time frame, just be aware that um, things could be a little hairy just timing-wise and just getting some answers. We're going to work our best to keep things moving and pushing. Um, but if we want to go and look at things earlier, we can do that as well. If something works out and we can save you money and it's prior to your renewal, then don't feel like you're locked in. You can't be. You can stay with what you have. You are locked into your rates until your next renewal. But if we find something that's even better, we can go ahead and take a look at that early. And we can you know, move you to that time frame if you so want to do so. Let's talk just a little bit on the law changes and the impact. Um, I kind of have two columns here, the delays and the changes. And again, if you've kind of been paying attention at all in the news and what's going on, it depends on what news you're watching as well. You know that as well. Some have different slants on it. We're really going to try to keep this uh, black and white, and here's what it is uh, you know, with it. So it depends on what news or organization you're getting things from, of what kind of slants you may be getting on the, de the delays and the changes. Um, the first one I have under delay, keep your coverage. Do you remember when uh, everybody was complaining at the end of last year, especially in the individual market, their plans were getting canceled? And they were saying, my plans were getting canceled. It was millions of people lo losing their coverage. Well, the reason their plans were getting canceled, they weren't just completely getting canceled. They were getting canceled and being put on one of the new 2014 plans because the law said you had to fall within certain requirements, and the carrier said in order for us to ensure that you are compliant, we got to end your current plan, and we got to put you on one of these new plans that fall within the law guidelines. Well, all of that caused then the uh, president to make an announcement last fall that, oh, you can keep your current coverage. That's all and good, but I will tell you that for a logistics purpose when it comes to the carriers, that threw everything in cycle. Um, when we had one carrier we were at um, last over the last week where they said they knew that they were going to offer those early renewals. They were going to allow groups to renew last December. It took them a year to create that entire process to make sure it flowed perfectly. And then this came out and they were and then the law said, okay, no, no, now you can keep your current plan, 
all that year preparation, they don't have that time frame anymore. Now they've got to figure out how to constantly and, you know, immediately get it going. So what it has done is it said um, that an actual, the, a letter went out to the state commissioners back in November and said that we're allowing people to be able to keep the current plans basically until October of 2016. But I will tell you, not every single carrier is on board with that. And you're going to find that. That uh, we have, as of right now, here in Georgia, United Healthcare, Coventry, Blue Cross, but Blue Cross has some caveats with theirs. Um, Kaiser and Assurance are going to allow you to keep your current plan as an option. So you're not going to be forced to move to one of the options during this next renewal. Blue Cross is still trying to figure out their process. As of right now, they're saying if you took the early renewal last December, then you can keep your current plan. If you didn't take the early renewal, you can't. But they have said they may change that. Aetna has not come out and said anything yet. So as of right now, Aetna is not offering that option to keep your current plan at the end of the year. So a lot of, you know, even though this came out, it still gives a lot of opportunity for even the carriers to say, what can we do and what can't we do with the time frame we have. So that is definitely a big one to consider. Some things I'm going to go through quicker. The pay or play mandate does not hit anybody in this room. But that is um, the delay in if you have, um, if you're more employees and you have to pay a penalty if you don't offer insurance or you pay a penalty if you do not um, offer the right amount of coverage, the correct coverage based on whether it's based on what they have to pay or based on how rich the plan is. Um, what they have done was delay for a certain time. So if you are a 50 to a 99 person group, there's some um, delays in there that you qualify for. It gets very complicated. And the reason I say that is that this, in this one delay came out and it's 227 pages long just in itself. So it seems really easy to say you can delay this, but when they actually came out to say it, it took 227 pages to go through all the changes with it. So what I would say is you're not in that. Um, if your group is going to be moving, if you are near that threshold of hitting 50, we need to have a side conversation and we need to tell you kind of what to expect in the time frames um, on that. But if you anticipate seeing that in the future, again, we can talk further about it, but I'm not going to focus on it since it doesn't apply to most of us in the room. You all have heard about the individual mandate delay. This already has passed, but remember they kept extending how long you could get um, an individual policy to not have to pay the penalty. And to, um, so when you go and file your taxes at the end of this year, or I guess early next year for 2014, if you don't have coverage during that time frame, you would pay a penalty as an individual. And they kept delaying um, portions and pieces of that. Um, the bottom one on the de delays is, this one is a potential delay. It's not, they have not come out and said it is going to happen, but you may have heard, you know, you have this exchange, which is where individuals have been able to go and buy insurance. Well, there's also a site called The Shop, which is where small businesses can go and buy insurance. And what it is supposed to have been able to do is that a group could go out there and say, we offer group insurance, but then the individuals can pick whatever carrier or plan they want. Because remember right now, the company picks a carrier. You pick and you say, here's our carrier that we have, here's our plans that we have. Well, this would say, we're offering group insurance, you can go and do this, but you can pick whatever carrier and whatever plan. Now, that all sounds like a really great option, but this is also supposed to be able to generate one bill with all these different carriers to the company. Very complex. If you think about it, how difficult it is for billing with one carrier, imagine if you have 10 employees and they pick six different carriers, and all those different carriers are supposed to bill into one bill to your company. Um, it's very complicated, and so there's been a lot of delays, and we probably do anticipate more to come there, but they're saying that there could be more delays on that. So it could be something that we could talk to you more about. Um, right now, there's not you know, a whole lot with it. Um, with the changes, um, the repeal of the annual deductible limit. So we're going to talk about in a second kind of the new plan designs for 2014. And when the law was first passed, it said a deductible for these new plans couldn't be more than 2,000 for an individual or 4,000 for a family. Which if you think about that's very rich if you consider how many different options we've had in the past. Um, so what they have done is repealed that portion of it because even when that law was in a place, it's in place right now for 2014, this repeal goes into 2015. 
Um, but you're going to see that once we start showing you options, the richer plans will follow it within, and some carriers do hold by that 2000 deductible, but you're going to find there's still a lot of plan options we're going to show you that could be over that 2000 deductible. So there has been some flexibility with it, but they have said it's gotten a little too complex that the carriers have said we can't to, in order to meet all these different requirements, it's really difficult to actually keep that deductible at this level and meet all these other options we'll talk about as well. You may have heard if anybody has a flexible spending account, if you have a health and flexible spending account, in the past, remember, it was use it or lose it. You had nothing to roll over. Um, right now, you can actually roll over $500 into it, and it was starting here in 2014. So if you have an FSA, if you are going to offer an FSA, um, which allows people to put money aside pre-tax to pay for their health situations over that next year, um, there is a way we would have to amend your plan. So you can't just automatically assume it happens. You have to amend your plan in order to take this $500 rollover. You would lose whatever else, so it's only $500 that can roll over. Um, reporting relief to the IRS. This one's going to be fun, and right now we're not sure the impact you're going to have on your size group, but the government has to keep track. How are they going to determine whether everybody has coverage and whether your coverage is affordable and whether you meet all these different requirements? And think especially for groups that are 50 and over that go towards this penalty where they're going to have to pay a, a tax or penalty and they don't meet it. There is a lot of reporting requirements that are going to happen to meet those deadlines and to meet those that criteria. So they come out and said we're going to streamline it, we're going to make it. I was on a conference call about a week and a half ago where they were talking about this stuff that's going to come out in like 2016. My head was swimming and it was the condensed version. So even though it's going to be condensed, anticipate that there's going to be some reporting even at group size, your size, um, where you're going to have to disclose some information in order to all within the guidelines of the law. Um, this coming year, right now on the individual market, and I mean it was out there, but I think a lot of people didn't even realize it. There was, you know, when you're on Medicare, you have to enroll during a certain time frame, and then you can't enroll unless you have a you qualify for Medicare throughout the year, um, like a special event, until the following year, that following fall. It always falls within that November, December, January time frame. Well, that's how the individual market's going to work now. And if you haven't realized that, when the mandate delayed till 331.14, that cut off where people could get individual coverage unless they have a qualified event until this fall. So that means if somebody didn't pick up any insurance and they don't get it through their group, they may have to pay the penalty because they're not going to be able to just say, hey, I want to go and get an insurance plan mid-year. They can't, you know, oh, I need a surgery. I'm on my way to the hospital. Let me call and get That's what they're trying to, you know, stop people from doing. They actually added another month to the end of open enrollment here coming up this fall so that there's more time frame for people to enroll. And then they've also announced some new out-of-pocket maximums. I'm not going to cover that because we're going to talk about that here in just one second. Tracy? Yes? They can enroll in the fall, but it would be for January 1st. It would be for January 1st. So even though they may be able to enroll in September, they still want to cover the that's correct. Everything is leading towards those, everything's calendar year. So even though you can enroll, your effective date still won't be until January. One other law, just so you know, um, that did happen, that you may, it's not the law yet, but you may have heard that the uh, House was trying to change the full-time status from 30 hours to 40 hours. That would impact a lot, because right now the law says, if you work 30 hours a week, you should be offered your insurance, or that's when that you know comes in to be considered you know for the groups. And the House passed the bill saying that's changing to 40, which you know think about all those companies that change people's hours below 30, so they don't have to offer them insurance, or they're considering doing that. Um, the president says he's going to veto it if it ever goes to that level, but I don't know. There's always something that's in the works and changing, so you're going to hear about different things there. Um, but let's talk about the actual plan designs that are going to be coming for 2014. Because if you haven't gone through a renewal, um, this is coming for you. And remember that most of you will have the option to keep your current plan. But when you look at that, you also want to compare it to these new options. Because again, you might find that it could be a benefit to you. The biggest one is how the rates are going to be determined. 
they're actually going to an adjusted community rating system. What does that all mean? What that basically means is that in the past, they could look at your industry, your SIC code of your business, where are you located, what are your demographics, and most importantly, what is the health history? They looked at the claims history and they looked at the future anticipation and they said, based on all of this, there was a lot of factors, here's how we came up with the rates for your particular group. Well, all that's kind of gone out the, out the door because now for 2014 plans, they can only really use these four different criteria. Age, they're going to look at how old are the members that are enrolling, and it's only a three to one ratio. So what that means is that the person who's the oldest, so if you have, which basically at this point goes to 60, age 64, because once you get to 65, you should go in on Medicare on the individual market. You can be on group plans past that age. But basically, they look at time, um, age groups from in your 60s versus to somebody who's you know a child. There shouldn't be a more than a 3 to 1 ratio between the highest and the lowest cost. And everything has an individual, each, each age has a different rate. So in the past where it was, if you were a really small group, if you were under 10 employees and you had age-banded rates, it was, if you were 20 to 25, this was your rate. If you were 40 to 45, this was your rate. Well, that's not even the case anymore. If you're 29, here's your rate. If you're 28, here's your rate. If you're 30, here's your rate. It's all different on every particular age. Tobacco status plays a factor. This is basically an honor system. There hasn't been a lot in regards to how this will work, but um, if you have been a tobacco user, and how they define it is if you have used tobacco three to four times a week within the last six months, that would be considered a tobacco user. And so now your rates are based on what is your age, what's your tobacco status. Your family size, that just means that they're going to look at those same factors for every family member. So if it's just for yourself, they're just looking at your age and your tobacco status. If you're covering your family, we have to look at the age and tobacco status of every single family member. So keep that in mind when we need censuses from your group. It's no longer that here's the employee, here's their date of birth, and they want family coverage. We're going to need to know if they want family coverage, we need to know here's the, um, here's the date of birth, here's the tobacco status for every single family member enrolling. So there's going to be more data that you're going to have to help us compile because they carriers won't even give us rates without it. So we're going to have to know that information. Um, geographic area, this is going to be more of a factor. Um, basically they use for group insurance, they're going to use where the group is located. Um, but if you had an individual plan, then obviously it's where you are individually located. Um, but that's it. So if you think about that, um, if you are a 40-year-old male or female, non-tobacco user, and your greatest health, you're going to pay the exact same rates on a plan that a 40-year-old male or female, non-tobacco user, who's chronically ill. There's going to be no difference. So that really does uh, apply the factors, and you'll kind of see how even the graph here, those groups that would be maybe your younger, healthier groups in the past have got to be kind of met in the middle with maybe our older or unhealthier groups that have paid a lot in the past. We kind of have to meet that in the middle because they're creating this kind of this regular just community composite rate. So it's all that information we looked at in the past is not, it's kind of out the window. Now, when you're looking at rates, the nice thing is, is that there's no underwriting. So once we have this information and we give you rates, those are true accurate rates. So that is a nice thing. So it's one less step if we're looking at just these 2014 and fully insured plans and we're saying, give us your census, we pull them and you get it, you're going to see true rates versus what has, um, you know, where before we'd say, here's the best rates, here's what they might be at the worst. We need to fill out applications, we need to disclose health history, and then we come back with what your rates really are. That's out the window on these type plans. Any questions on this? I will tell you right now, even if your group is over 10 employees, you know, right now you have what's called a composite rate. So you have a rate for anybody, regardless of their age, if they have employee only coverage, this is how much they pay. Or if they have family coverage, this is how much they pay. Um, all of the carriers, with the exception of Humana, are doing individual age-based rates, regardless up to 50 person groups. So that means that when you get invoiced, every single person is kind of going to have a different rate because they're all different ages or tobacco statuses. Um, Humana is still doing composite rates, so what that means is that if your group is 10 or more employees enrolled, they'll actually can do that 
here's your employee rate, here's your employee spouse rate, here's your employee children rate, your family rate. We have calculators to help you with that. So if you are a 30 person group and you're thinking, I can't look at 30 individual rates, we'll probably calculate that for you, show you the in composite rates so you can see it side by side. Um, but I just tell you this one more complexity for us to have to discuss with you is that once you do enroll, you're going to see that bill is going to have everybody at an individual rate. So obviously when someone terminates, your bill is going to be impacted by the person's individual rate. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So uh, for each employee, if they have five dependents, will there be a separate rate for each, each dependent? Yes, and what they do is they rate for the first three oldest. Okay. So if they have five children, let's say two children, because you said dependents. So let's okay. say there's five children. They will rate on the first three oldest children. They will, you won't have to pay on the other two. You will have to pay for the spouse. So you'd have a rate for the employee, for the spouse, and for the children. It's a little bit more complicated when you're you know, looking at that. Did, any other questions on this? All the plans now are going to be classified in 2014 in four categories. So when you see a title of a plan, it's going to say platinum, gold, silver, or bronze in it. And what that means is that it fits within a certain criteria. And basically, the easiest way to explain this is, is that if you are on the bronze plan, you are, that's kind of what they consider the lower cost, kind of the base plans. It just means if I am the average person on the plan, I'm the member, that I should, on average, not have to pay more than 40% of the total cost of services that I have done that year, that year on that plan. So that means in premiums, uh, not in premiums, in deductible, in co-pays, in anything that I'd be paying out of pocket on that plan for, I should not have to pay 40, more than 40%. I pay 40, the carrier covers 60%. If I step up to the silver, it means that on average, and again, I have to say on average because you always have that person that uses a lot more, a lot less, but if I'm an average person, I shouldn't have to pay more than 30% of to use this plan of cost of benefits. Carrier pays 70, gold is 20% versus the carrier does 80, and the platinum is 10 and 90. And I will tell you there are very few platinum plans out there because they are very unaffordable. There are some. Some of the carriers are doing them, but not many. Um, and I have not really shown. I would say most of the plans that I have um, done with groups so far this year have been gold and silver. Are you finding that to be the case as well, Monty? So a lot of gold, more than I even expected. Um, but I've been doing a lot of gold and silver plans um, because the bronze plans, again, are your lowest cost. And what we're finding is if somebody's offering like two plans in their group, they may do a bronze level plan and maybe a silver or gold plan if you want a more base plan and a richer plan. Um, but everything falls in within these four categories. But I will tell you, it's not this easy because you can have a gold plan and there could be 50 gold plan designs because it's how that carrier has interpreted because basically they, they say, if I have to hit this, uh, what they call an actuarial value. So if the, if the carrier says, I need a plan as a silver plan and I have to make sure it hits this, that 70%, they actually have a 2% threshold either way. So they could have a silver plane design, and it could look completely different than the silver plane design. Or they probably have a lot of silver plane designs. They may offer 10, 20 silver plane designs. They won't look like the same silver plane designs that the other carriers, because all they have to do is fall within that value. It's how their um, how the carrier could design the plans to meet it. So there's a lot of flexibility. So you would think, oh, this is going to be easier. I'm just going to pick a silver plan. It's not that easy. What silver plan? Because all it does is mean it has to fall within its value. There could be a lot of plan designs that fit that. Some of the other plan design changes. I talked about the, um, the deductible here about, at least for 2014, you're going to see a lot of the plans, especially the platinum and gold plans, are not going to have a deductible over $2,000. Um, but the one thing you're going to find different is that a lot of the plans in the past, the family deductible was three times the individual. So if you had a 2000 deductible for an individual, the family deductible was typically 6000 And what that meant was that, you know, if you had a family of four, you would have one person that would hit the 2000 deductible and the accumulation of the others that would hit the additional deductible amount. 
now they're saying it's it's just two was just um, twice the individual. So if you have two thousand individual, you have a four thousand family. If you have fifteen hundred individual, you have a three thousand family. That makes it richer for families because they have less out of pocket exposure in case of a scenario of hitting that. The annual out of pocket. This is why I skipped on the other slide I wanted to cover here. This is what's really different because in the past when we would go over plans, we would say copays or copays. If you have copays, you pay those forever. There is no limitation to that. So if you go to the doctor and you go 100 times to the doctor that year, you pay that copay 100 times. Or if you get a prescription, all of that was unlimited. And the only thing that really had the cap was the deductible. So we would say, okay, you have a $1,000 deductible. You're covered at 80% once you hit that deductible. Um, so that means you have to pay 20% after it, only till you hit $3,000. But your co-pays for you always would pay. It was a little bit more complex because you had some things that had like a stop loss, and you had other expenses, your co-pays that went on unlimited. Well, now what they've done is they've taken this out-of-pocket max and they said everything applies to it. So if a plan has an annual out-of-pocket max, it truly is your stop loss for every expense. So your doctors, your prescriptions, your urgent care co-pays, your emergency room co-pays, all those things that were unlimited in the past, all now go towards the annual out-of-pocket maximum. For 2014, the magic number is 63.50 for an individual, 2,700 for a family, 12,700 for a family. It doesn't mean if you went to a richer plan, that out-of-pocket might go less. But what that means is that deductible, office visit, every single thing will not cost more than that. The people who are probably benefiting the most from this is um, people who have specialty drugs that are extremely expensive that are capping out of that and maybe they're spending on top of their medical deductible. They are, so let's say they have a, you know, in some cases we have three or four thousand dollar medical deductible they're hitting and then they're paying another couple thousand dollars for specialty drugs and at the same time they're going to all these doctor visits. Well, all of those expenses now cap at 6350. So if they hit that magic number in that calendar year, they'll pay no more expenses at all for anything the rest of that calendar year. Does that make sense? So everything goes into that number. So when we're looking at plan designs, you'll see that annual pocket and you might think, whoa, that's huge. We only had a thousand or two thousand or three thousand as an annual pocket before. It's because remember, not everything went into that number last year, but now everything goes into this number now but this is the highest, the number did increase, and that's what I mentioned, um, I had on that back slide, the out-of-pocket for 2015 is 6,600 and 13,200 for a family. So as 2015 plans come up, especially when you get to like the bronze level plans, they for sure are gonna show that $6,600 maximum. All plans now have to cover these 10 required area of coverage. Most of those benefits were always already covered in your plans before. But the ones that typically weren't, that are going to have to be on your plan, regardless of whether they use them or not, is pediatric dental, pediatric vision. So even if you are a older male with no children, your benefits plan still covers pediatric dental, pediatric vision. That's probably the one that is the, 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 the most different one. And another one that um, kind of is different is that maternity will now include infertility. So if anybody's ever known, that's a very expensive uh, treatment um, that in the past most of the carriers, especially for small group, never covered, or they did, it was very minimal. It now is covered under essential benefits. So you have lower deductibles, especially for families. You have an annual pocket max. You have to cover more benefits. Is it kind of drawing a picture of how people have been really scared about how these rates are higher? And now we can't even factor in health history why you're hearing that, you know, the rates are having to factor all of these in. Um, and the one at the bottom is that routine and approved clinical trials um, are now in, um, included as well on the medical plans. We haven't heard a lot about this one yet, a lot of uses. We don't think we've gotten a lot of even customer service issues on this one yet. Um, but it's just something that has been in the plan that uh, will also be on these plan designs. Any questions on the plan designs? Does it make sense how they're, in a lot of cases, they're richer than what we have seen in the past. They cover more. Yes, sir. If you keep your current plan, 
these don't apply. These do not apply. Some carriers have already, so the question was, if you keep your current plan, do these apply? It depends on your carrier. Some carriers have automatically said there's some benefits they're going to go ahead and build into the plans. So some of these benefits you may have in there, but whatever you have your benefits now will be what your benefits would be for 2014, so you would not have to comply with all of these. As well as the big one, if you keep your current plans, you keep your current rating system. So health history will be factored in. It's only if you move to one of these new plans do you go to the new rating system. So especially if you are a healthier group, you might find this, uh, th this would be the case where keeping your current plan may make sense. But if you are a, have a lot of health issues or the premiums have really risen because of it, um, we might find that the 2014 plan designs may make sense because the rates are lower. But it really will be, again, you know, those, their age band. So it creates quite a, a difference on, you know, your, your younger to your older of how, the, how that impact will be. But that's kind of the different things that we'll look at. We'll look at that total premium and kind of compare it to your total premium at your renewal. So your current premium, keeping your own plan versus going to one of these new plan designs. Yes, that's something you'll be able to give us the actual. So, yes, yeah, when you get your renewal, um, if your carrier is allowing you to keep your current plan, we'll get the actual here's. And what's nice is that it's already underwritten, so it already has your health history. We don't have to do applications. Um, but then, as long as we have the census, and what our biggest thing is, before we even get your renewal, let's get your census. Gather, start gathering that information of all those dates of birth and all those tobacco status. Start gathering that. We have a new census form, so we can send that out to you. We have a new census form you can use that puts all that information in there. We can go ahead and have that. We can have the rates. And again, once we have those rates, those are good, accurate rates, as long as the demographics are right. And then you can compare that with your renewal. Just to keep them from an employee from lying about their tobacco status, how are they going to track that? At this point, there is no tracking. And a lot of them have a very, um, if they are a tobacco user and they go into a cessation program, it doesn't mean that they stop using it, but if they go into a program that they're considered no longer a tobacco user. It's an honor system, though. Will there be a time where they do things to track it more? Possibly. Um, but, you know, we've even asked the carriers, well, what happens if it's an honor system? They say I'm a not tobacco user and they have lung cancer. You can pretty much tell by it that it was due to tobacco use. Um, can, you know, Will that impact them? And the carriers have said, you know, we have no way to go back and say you're not going to have coverage. I'd be scared to take that bet if I was a tobacco user, but, you know, it really is an honor system on it. A few other things just to um, impacts on 2014. The, re um, the removal of pre existing condition clauses. So obviously, if your rates are based on um, no health history, it also is not going to be a factor of what your pre-existing conditions are. They've already taken away that for children. So a couple years ago, remember that we, we couldn't, they never could decline a child. And this, you're going to see this impact more in the individual market. If you ever try to get an individual policy in the past and maybe a child got declined based on health history, a few years ago that was removed. So if you, they had to accept the child, they didn't have to accept the adults. Now, Coverage has to be accepted for all, regardless of health history. Waiting period limit. This is a big one for you to know in the room. If your waiting period right now for your um, health insurance is over 90 days, which includes first of the month following 90 days, that has to be changed at renewal. Because the law says your waiting period can no longer be more than 90 days the maximum. So what a lot of groups have done, or we can go ahead and change it you know, earlier, but most of them are doing that renewal, is that if you want to keep that first of the month because it's easier for accounting purpose-wise and just paperwork purpose-wise, then you switch it first of the month to 60 days. Or you do day immediately at 90 days. But if you do that, remember that will be in the middle of the month because it will depend on where that 90 days falls based on their higher day. So keep that, that is one that could impact you. And wellness programs, um, this is funny because it's been in the, it's in the law, it's been talked about, but not a lot have really um, taken the leap on it yet, but it has uh, it increased the award that you can offer in wellness programs um, to employees, um, 
where it was a 20% reward you could give them to a 30%. And if it was tobacco related, if it was a cessation program, you could actually change the, the reward 50%. And that could be impact and premiums and benefits and rewards. It gets a little bit more complex. So if that's something that you want to discuss further, we need to have a side conversation on that one. Who's as well. rewarding from the company? So it's just, a, it's just an optional thing. It's not anything that. Correct. It's not the government a, doesn't support. Exactly. Yeah. It's a if the company if you as a company says say we have a lot of tobacco users and we're having to pay and we you know we want to you know we want there to be more impact on trying to get them to not be a tobacco user because it impacts premiums and everything in general. Then you can create a program that um, you know benefits or there's a distinction between. But there's a lot of nuances with this. So. And say if it's something that you want to consider, we can talk about it on the side. But um, you can incorporate a wellness kind of benefit reward in your um, when you're talking about health insurance. That's how they should tie the tobacco thing into being more real. Yeah, I mean, if the company if the companies know their employees, and that's where the impact. Where and most of the people that are looking at wellness, their first the first thing they start with is the tobacco, because that is what you know of. That's exactly it. That's what you know of. And there's different types of wellness programs because there's one that's rewarded based on results and there's one reward based on participation. So it does get a little bit more complex. And a big one. So not only are your plan funds changing, how your rates are changing, but now you have all these taxes and fees that are going to be added on your plans as well. Some of these have already been impacted, but think about your phone bill and the pat you know, your phone bill where you have, here's my services and then here's all my taxes at the bottom. That's kind of like how health insurance is going. Um, so what you're going to see is there's actually three fees. One of these fees will go away if you go to self-insured, but as a fully insured group, so yeah, even as an individual or a group plan, these taxes, fees are going to be on your coverage. So you have one that is a insurer's fee. Um, this is a permanent fee. And what it is, it's um, your funding the subsidies that are being paid on the individual market for the exchange. So if somebody went to get an individual policy and they applied and they, based on their income, were able to get a subsidy, so the government is helping to pay for those. How is the government helping to pay for those? With the insurer fee on the group plan. So you're going to be paying some taxes that will help the individual market. Um, same thing, so it could be right now it's approximately two and a half percent of premium. Um, should go, or right, well, actually, right now it's three to four percent of premium. And it is permanent. We have the transitional reinsurance fee, and this one only goes for the few years. This is the one at $63 annually per, per covered life. So anybody who has the insurance is paying $63 annually. If you're fully insured, this is built into your rates. So this is built in when you get your renewal, these are in your rates. And a lot of the carriers are coming out and saying, here's your rates, here's your PPAC of fees, and here's your total premium. And some are saying that they're in there. But others are saying the reason why you're seeing an increase are because these are in there. Uh, but this fee actually pays for, um, actually goes to the insurer, the insurance company. So if I am an insurance carrier and I have been able to, um, I've written a lot of business, <laughs> and that business has a lot of health issues, but I can't charge them different for it, this fee is going to go to those carriers to help them offset what they have to pay claims. PCORI fee, this is a research fee that's already been started. You already actually are paying for this on your last, you're starting on your last renewal. Um, it's $2 per member per year. <coughs> Next. So it will kind of increase with medical inflation. It goes to 2019. So you have all these kind of on top of it as well. So a lot just itself on um, on that. Do you want to take a break?